We'll start with the um, last talk for this session. Um, Natalie is going to be talking about identity check problem for shallow quantum circuits. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about this joint work uh, on the identity, identity check problem with uh, joint work with Sergey Bravi and Min Tran, who are at IBM. OK, so, so we're kind of just going to talk about a pretty simple problem. Um, that problem is I give you two different quantum circuits, and I ask you, are they the same circuit or are they different? You know, maybe the gates aren't the same, but I just want to know, are they implementing the same unitary? Um, you know, I could also ask you, I give you one circuit, and I ask if it is the identity or not. Um, and, you know, as you might guess, or you might be able to tell, these are the equi equivalent questions because, you know, you can just do U V dagger. Um, and... It's a very simple question, but there's many applications. So one is invalidating quantum algorithms. So you know, here's the quantum Fourier transform circuit from Nielsen and Tuong. Um, but you know, for whatever reason, maybe in your quantum computer that you keep at home, uh, you know, you can't implement all these gates. So you have to implement it this way. But you know, ideally, you'd like some way to verify that it's the right circuit. Or let's say someone just gives you the circuit, like a student um, in your quantum information class, and you want to grade their homework. Um, how can you tell? Uh, so another application is for developing quantum algorithms. So, you know, maybe you have some parameterized quantum circuit um, and you want to tune your parameters so that you can implement some unitary V as best you can. Um, and so if you have a way to tell how close these are, then, you know, you can try to do some sort of optimization algorithm over your angles. Um, and, you know, one example of this is when you're trying to minimize trotter error in Hamiltonian simulation. Um, and also, this is like a pretty interesting question uh, from a complexity theoretic standpoint, because um, as I'll talk about soon, uh, estimating the distance between two circuits turns out to be um, QMA hard. Uh, or I mean, you know, more specifically, you have this non-identity check and the identity check, um, which are QMA and co-QMA complete. Um, and so, OK, I, I mentioned that this actually turns out to be really hard to estimate. Um, so in particular, right now, I'm talking about to within, you're trying to estimate this distance to within additive inverse polynomial error. Um, and so in the general case, when you, you, know, you have some quantum circuit and you're allowed measurement and maybe you're allowed to trace stuff out, um, this problem turns out to be p-space hard. Let's see. But um, you know, if, we, if we restrict ourselves to just unitary circuits, um, then this problem is still QMA hard. Um, and I don't know if you guys, I don't know if this is surprising or not, because, you know, we're trying to tell something about, you know, these polynomial size circuits. Um, maybe it makes sense that you would need a polynomial size circuit to, to know. Um, but, you know, you could ask this question about, you know, really simple quantum circuits. So like, for example, these constant depth quantum circuits that are like geometrically local in one dimension, meaning like your qubits are laid out on a line and you're only allowed nearest neighbor gates. Like these circuits are really easy to simulate. You know, we can calculate output probabilities, we can sample from them. Um, but actually, still the identity check, like calculating how close the circuit is to identity, is still QMA hard, which is, um, you know, maybe surprising. Um, and so, okay, you know, I, I've been talking about distance, but I haven't really defined anything. Um, and so, the, the hardness results I talked about on the last slide, uh, you know, actually hold for a variety of distance metrics you might be familiar with. Uh, but the two that we're going to focus on in this talk are spectral norm and diamond norm. So, you know, spectral norm is just a maximum eigenvalue. Um, diamond norm is defined for channels, and it's a bit weirder, but the physical interpretation um, is that, you know, if you have some experiment that uses uh, your unitary U as a subroutine, and then you replace it with the identity. Um, this diamond distance is uh, tells us like bounds the total different like the total um, difference in the like outcomes of your experiment uh, in total variation distance, whether or not you use U or identity. Um, and there's also a geometric interpretation of these two different norms. So you know. A unitary U has all of its eigenvalues on the unit circle, and um, the the diamond distance is actually like if you look at the convex hole, 
of, of all the eigenvalues, it's going to be this like diameter of a polygon. And, you know, this the spectral norm distance um, is going to be like the for the you look at the furthest point from one and it's the length of that thing. And in this talk, we're going to be focused on diamond norm, which uh, we called delta Z delta of u. Um, but you know, in our paper, we also have a result for this other spectral norm. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about like two different ways you might try to uh, talk about error when you're trying to have like an approximation algorithm. So the first is additive error, which is what we've talked about so far. So if you have additive error epsilon, this means your estimate is between, you know, actually like delta minus epsilon and delta plus epsilon. Um, on the other hand, you might have multiplicative error where, you know, your estimate is like, you know, an upper bound on the true uh, delta, but, you know, it's also a lower bound with this factor of alpha, which is going to be greater than one. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, as I showed, getting this additive error to be uh, like, on the order of one over polynomial is QMA hard. Um, and so this tells us that, okay, for multiplicative error, it's also hard if you if you have additive, or if, if your um, error factor is like one plus one over poly polynomial. But, you know, you could ask, what about if your multi multiplication, multiplicative error is bigger? Like what if it's constant, for example? Um, is it feasible then? Um, and in this paper, we show an algorithm for uh, estimating this uh, diamond distance um, up to like constant multiplicative error. Uh, in particular, um, if your unitary has depth h and is, or if it's implemented by a circuit, that's depth h and ge geometrically local um, in d dimensions, um, then we get an estimate that has um, approximation ratio alpha. Um, and yeah, the runtime is like this ugly thing, but when you plug in constant depth, constant dimension, this is linear time. Um, and so, you know, even though, um, this problem is QMA hard, uh, for like, like inverse polynomial additive error, turns out that, you know, we actually can still get an approximation algorithm if we, you know, tweak what kind of, um, approximation we care about. And, you know, one thing I'll note is that uh, in the case where delta is like really small, like inverse exponential, then this estimate is like extremely good. Uh, like, you know, much better than like a uh, one over poly additive error. And so now I'll give a high level overview of how the algorithm works. And uh, to just help us, we'll kind of keep this 2D uh, like this two dimension quantum circuit picture in mind. So first we're gonna color all of our qubits so that each color kind of has many small clusters that are like spatially separated. So here you can see there's like all these red regions um, and you know, you can think of the red regions as being like constant size um, and each of the red regions are like pretty far from each other. And uh, okay, now we're going to consider the channel that you know applies our unitary u, and then traces out or throws away um, all qubits that aren't blue. Um, and so you know we can look at these blue regions that I'll, I labeled like b1 through b8 in this case. And and then what we're going to do is we're going to estimate how far the channel this channel is that that just outputs only the blue qubits how far it is from, you know, if we did the same thing to the identity channel. Um, and, uh, you know, the way we're going to make this estimate is going to exploit the fact that this uh, blue channel has a product structure. If we like, have these blue regions sufficiently sp spread apart. And finally, our estimate is just going to be the sum of all of these estimators for each color. Um, okay, so so now I'm going to get a bit more um, into how how we make these estimates. Um, but first, it's nice to kind of have the, the following nice observation, and uh, hopefully people here are a little bit um, comfortable with tensor network diagrams, but it won't be too crazy. So um, 
a really nice fact that we're going to exploit is that if um, your diamond distance isn't uh, is, isn't root two, which is like the maximum your diamond distance can be, then you have the following thing where uh, you know this first object is like okay, so now you're in, if you're unitary acts on n qubits. Now we have like two n qubits, so like this orange wire is like an extra um, extra qubits. And first we swap these two registers. We apply u dagger to the first uh, register. We swap back, and then we apply u. Um, and overall, we're looking at the like you know spectral norm of this object minus just identity on both qubits. Okay, why is this the case? This is kind of strange maybe if you haven't seen this. So it falls from two pretty nice facts. The first is that, you know, this this delta of u equals um, you know, the norm of the u tensor u dagger minus identity. Um, <clears throat> and the second is that, you know, uh, if if you if you if you if you follow me so far then okay, we have u tensor u dagger. Now we can just move this u dagger under uh, and you know uh, you're allowed to do this and what this corresponds to is just you know you swap you apply one you swap back uh, you could have just like applied them separately <clears throat> and so okay so so now what we want to estimate right is this this weird swap uh, this like weird swap object minus identity and here I've recolored Okay, the drawing has lowered in quality, but also it has colors now. So the uh, I, I colored, yeah, okay. So um, according to, you know, the coloring, I've, I've like just now have wires so that there's a new wire for, you know, the, the red wire resembles all the, the red qubits and so on. Um, uh, yeah. And uh, okay, so we want this thing, but instead, uh, like I don't know how to compute that. So instead, what I can tell you how to compute are the following three things. Where, okay, I you, we don't swap everything, but you know, first we just look at this object where only the red register is swapped. You know, same with blue and green. And these are actually what we're going to have our estimate our estimators be for each of the colors. Um, and okay, so we add them up. Uh, and you know it's kind of nice actually just using triangle inequality. Um, this whole thing is upper bounds the actual diamond distance on top. Um, and also it's not too hard to show that each of these things on their own are upper bounded by the diamond distance. And so overall now, you know, we have a approximation like now this this the sum of these things uh, is a good estimator for for delta with an approximation ratio of three. Um, and you know, if you were to generalize this to more colors, um, the, the the approximation ratio comes from the number of colors. Um, okay, so now we still need to figure out how we're going to calculate this red estimator, which looks like this. Um, well, well, it looks okay. Maybe I shouldn't have revealed. It looks like this. And then because of our, our uh, clever coloring, um, you can actually you know, write it as a tensor product structure like this. Um, uh, and each of these are going to have constant size, which is really nice because you can just anything like any system that's constant size, you know, we, we can just like fully calculate efficiently classically because, you know, there's exponential blow up in system size, but it's constant, so whatever, it's free. Um, nice. So, so right, okay, so we can compute each of these things on their own explicitly. So, okay, so now uh, if writing this, uh, writing this uh, estimator of, of like this weird swap thing minus identity, um, what happens is because of this tensor product uh, structure, um, this is going to be the the maximum where you take, uh, okay, so you have like the eigenvalues of, you look at each the eigenvalues of like K1 and um, the eigenvalues of each of these. And then, so the eigenvalue of this thing is gonna be like 
the sum of if you take one from each. So yeah, so this estimator is going to be like if you maximize over like p1 from all the eigenvalues of k1, then you know p2 from the eigenvalues of k2, and so on, and then this quantity where um, you have e to the i times the sum of all these eigenvalues. Um, um, but although we can calculate what these these sets, we can calculate these sets of like eigenvalues. Now we have like way too many parameters to optimize over because like we can think about you know we're gonna have like like a linear number of these things, um, <clears throat> and so that's unfortunate. But we are okay because we have this really nice additivity lemma, um, and the like idea behind it is that if your unitary is really close to the identity, then each of these like ki's are also going to be really close to the to the identity, right? Like you take um, yeah, it's like, I mean, it, if you have some unitary that's close to identity, like if locally it's far from identity, like it's just not close to identity. Um, and okay, so so this tells us that each of these eigenvalues are really small. Um, and this makes this maximization thing easier because we can just take the maximum of each of the eigenvalues. Because um, like typically the, the reason that this thing would get expensive, this, this um, like trying to optimize over all these parameters is that you're trying to find the like angle that's farthest from one on the unit circle. And you're, you're, you know, you're, you're summing over, a, you're taking a bunch of different ones and combinations of them and you might wrap around the unit circle. And so um, <clears throat> you kind of need to just like try every single combination. But if you know they're all really small and you were trying to get as far from one as you can, the best thing you can do is just take the largest eigenvalue or the largest angle from each of these sets um, and that's how you're going to end up farthest from one. Um, so more concretely, you know, you you choose this angle, which is just you take the maximum angle from each of these eigenvalue sets. Um, and you know, if this whole thing is is less than pi over two, then then this estimate is is just e to the i theta minus one. That's the right angle. Um, and if it's bigger, then then actually your whole thing is your whole thing is quite far from identity. And so you can just output okay, I'm, I'm like very far from my identity and terminate and you're fine. Um, yeah, maybe this part, this is like the main technical thing I'll really go through. So um, uh, yeah, may, hopefully it's not too messy. Uh, okay, and so what were our, like I kind of just said our color, our coloring allowed us to have this like nice products structure um, but you know what? What actually were our coloring requirements? So you know we k colored our qubits, and um, so you know I have these like k sets for each color. And what did our coloring need to satisfy? Um, so first is that for every pair of like subsets of this coloring. So okay, so we also kind of partition them into clusters, so that for any two different clusters, they have disjoint backwards light cone. Um, and you know I've I've drawn those here. Um, and also that they, each of these clusters are constant size. Um, and, you know, if this is satisfied, then we get this, uh, our S, then we know that our estimator has an approximation ratio of K, where K was their number of colors. So, you know, you could ask, you know, in 1D, you, could, you, you only, if, if you have 1D geometrically local, so this means, you know, our qubits are laid out on this line, and let's say, you know, the light cones are just the cells that, like we've kind of drawn qubits here. So the, you know, you only have nearest neighbor gates and constant depth. So the light cone size, the light cones are only kind of going to be like, you know, within a short distance. Okay, so 1D, you need two colors. 2D, you need three colors. Uh, here, here's one way to do it. And, you know, in general, it turns out that if you have a D dimensional lattice, you only need D plus one colors. Um, and this was shown recently by these people. They're called like reclusive partitions. Um, and so this tells us that uh, our approximation ratio, this is how our approximation ratio ends up being uh, D plus one, where D is the, the dimension of your, cir like your circuit's locality. Um, okay, that's it. Now I just have future directions for anyone who's eager. Uh, 
So the first is better approximation constants. So you know we showed like an approximation ratio that was like a, that was like d plus one, a, super, a specific number. But maybe you could hope that you could get an approximation ratio that's one plus epsilon for any epsilon that you want. Um, that's constant. Um, and you know you might want more complex circuits. Like, is it also still easy up to multiplicative error for complicated circuits? So deeper circuits. Circuits that aren't geometrically local, you know, all to all connectivity, um, or where you allow non unitary gates like measurement, um, and you can like trace stuff out. Um, uh, and here's a drawing of one of those. But yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Are there any questions? Hey, thank you for the talk. So uh, what about if you, your um, additive error is slightly uh, larger, like is one over poly log or even constant? So what do you, is it hard or not? Um, I don't think like hardness is known. I would guess it's, I think for, I think it's definitely not known for constant because the way in which we know it's hard is like if, if it's um, basically we have like it's QMA hard if you're like really deciding if you're like really close to identity or not really close to identity. And so constant error is like kind of, uh, yeah, like just fully easy in these cases. So, I mean, like you think it can, a constant additive error can provide a similar uh, efficient algorithm? Yeah, I'm not sure. I would guess that for constant additive... It should be slightly harder than constant uh, multiplicative error, right? Um, I guess it... Uh, I guess it depends, because, like, depending on the regime of your... Sure, yeah, true. Like, if you're... if I don't know, yeah, like, you could have some family of unitaries that have... You, like, what you want to do, they have really small distance mm -hmm. and... Then additive is like pretty easy, but multiplicative is like really hard. Sure. So, yeah. but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Like, what's, mm. yeah. And then for like inverse polylog error, uh, that's also a good question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks for the great talk. Um, just one question. So um, you said that the additive error is QMA hard, uh, whereas the multiplicative error, you have an efficient algorithm. Does this kind of imply that it's easier to prove something that's closer to identity um, than, than not? Because uh, as you said, like this uh, accuracy gets better as long as uh, like multiplicative uh, error becomes more relevant when you're closer to uh, zero. Oh, maybe, though, like, um, maybe, but we also know that it's, like, hard to tell if you're close to identity with it. Like, still, you have this, like, inverse one over poly. Like, it's still, like, somehow it's still hard to decide to, between inverse one over poly error if you're, like, if, you, if you're trying to decide, let's say, am I identity or am I, like, greater than one over poly away? Um... Okay, wait, this is a good question because I, because that problem is like co-QMA hard, which is like probably not easy, but okay, yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe it means that like detecting if you're closer to identity is easy, but okay, yeah, sorry, I'm not sure. Now I'm confused. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? We have time maybe for one quick question. If not, um, then this is the end of the session. 
Um, I encourage you to go to the other tracks because I think there is still a talk there each. And uh, let's thank Natalie and all the other speakers of this session again.